Hello investors and welcome to my YouTube channel where I study the best investors and businesses from around the world. In this week's video, I'll be going over Li Lu's book, Civilization, Modernization, Value Investment, and China. That was published in 2020. Today's video is broken up into three key parts. Number one, the connection between modernization of China and value investing. Number two, the four big ideas in value investing. Number three, additional gems from Li Lu's investing. Li Lu has always been considered someone to be greatly admired, intelligent, articulate, yet also low profile and down to earth. Over the past 25 years, he has built one of the most successful investment track records ever. While he's already a legend in the circle of value investors, he seems to avoid fame and thought leadership, rarely appearing in public unless for a lecture at a business school. Li Lu's new book, Civilization, Modernization, Value Investment, and in China, was published in 2020 and is worth reading. Unfortunately, the book is only available in Chinese and only accessible through the use of Google Translate. More than half of the book focuses on his systematic thinking on China's modernization process, and the rest are transcripts of him discussing value investing based on his public lectures and talks given in China and America. In the first half of the book, he divides the history of human civilization into three major stages of leaping, namely 1.0, hunter-gatherer civilization, 2.0, agricultural civilization, and 3.0, technological civilization, which is a fantastic read. But in this video, however, I will cover the second half of the book, which is more geared towards Li Lu's thoughts on investing. Professor Jeremy Siegel of the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania has been conscientious and conscientious in collecting the performance of various major financial assets in the United States in the past few hundred years. The cornerstone of Siegel's research is this graph. Investing over 200 years, a $1 investment in gold would be worth just $4.02 today, adjusted for inflation, as $1 investment in treasury bonds would be worth $1,530, while a $1 investment in equities would be worth $700,000. And while the equity returns are overstated, because Siegel does not adjust for taxes or trading cost, the basic conclusion is valid. First, we will look at the connection between the modernization of China and value investing. Li Lu has been obsessed with the modernization of China since he was a teenager. He has always wanted to understand why the country's modernization process has been so difficult. In fact, over the past 200 years, Chinese and foreign intellectuals have also tried to understand this great puzzle. Value investing is another interesting topic that he stumbled upon, after coming to the United States and hearing one of Warren Buffett's speeches by accident, Li Lu only formed the connection between the modernization of China and value investing later in his life. He discovered, in the end, that the fundamental research required in value investing allows an investor to invest in the most righteous way by sharing the value creation by the companies we invest in and grow with them, instead of merely discovering the disparities of valuation. This is the core of value investing. This naturally led him to ask some new questions. How can outstanding companies achieve sustainable growth over a long period of time? What are the reasons for the growth? Is there a limit? To such growth, and what kind of economic environment promotes companies with such growth? He then found out that not only these outstanding companies, but also for the whole global economy and the whole human society, a strange phenomenon has been happening in the past two years. That is, the economy has begun to enter a sustained and progressive growth stage. This is what we call the power of compound interest the most important force in value investment. However, compound interest has only existed in the past 200 years in human society. 
after he studied the concepts of value investing and compound interest and learned about the economy's growth stage, he began to analyze the two topics. As Lilu wrote in his book, the whole process of modernization itself is actually a process of compound interest. According to his definition, modernization is the phenomenon that the whole economy begins to enter a stage of continuous progress and unlimited growth. He called it the law of modernization. It may take several decades until we can look back before we know whether this was right or not. Like Moore's law in the early years, observation can only lead to theories. Lilu's investment style is closely related to this observation. The essence of value investing is to explore and discover opportunities for compound interest, which is only a product of the phenomenon of modernization. The two phenomena can be thought of as the same modern phenomenon. This phenomenon of compound interest has only really appeared in the past 200 years. That is a very short period of time in human history. It will be several hundred years before we know whether the summary and explanation of this phenomenon can be verified. This is just like the Malthusian trap, where Malthus put forward his theory. He actually wanted to predict the future. It turns out that his prediction of the future is not very good and almost completely wrong, but his summary theory of the past agricultural society is correct. His book outlines the modernization phenomena over the last 200 years, and argues that value investing is proof that such a concept can yield a genuine return on investment, and therefore is a unification of knowing and doing. The modernization process itself is a compounding process, and in this sense, the essence of value investment is the same as modernization. Although the lockdown has posed great challenges to China and the rest of the world, Lilu is still confident about the future of China's economy. He believes that Chinese traditional culture suits the modern market economy well, and that China will still provide plenty of investment opportunities in the future. Secondly, we will look at the four big ideas in value investing. In his book, he transcribes his talks to different universities, and those lectures, I think, can broadly be summed up into the following four points of understanding value investing. Number one, stock as a piece of business. Number two, Mr. Market. Number three, the margin of safety. Number four, the circle of competence. The first three can be traced back to Benjamin Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor. And the last one was added by Buffett and Munger. These concepts are often overlooked when people first start investing. Graham, Buffett, Munger, Pabrai, and Lou love being the owners of the businesses they invest in, as opposed to a trader, which is just a temporary holder. This ownership mentality is important for investors because it urges them to learn more about the business. Nasib Talib talked about a similar concept in his book *Skin in the Game*. When an investor sees themselves as an owner, the risk-reward ratio becomes more balanced. This shift in mentality can also encourage the investor to invest not only in money but time into the business and provide constructive criticism when needed. The Mr. Market analogy teaches us the difference between investing and speculating. You can think of Mr. Market as someone who is extreme, moody, and thoughtless. The first thing that he does every morning is shout out the latest prices, doing this continuously throughout the day. When he's optimistic about the future, he acts like an excited auctioneer and increases the prices. But when he's depressed, he drastically lowers the prices. It in the book it says. The market is a mechanism for discovering human weaknesses, especially when the financial crisis comes. Only by being completely honest with knowledge can we survive, develop, and grow in the market. It's easy to see that Mr. Market is a very irrational person. The market operates on the extreme sides of the spectrum, continuously swinging back and forth 
from peaks to valleys. Most people choose this risky path and call themselves traders. It's the most obvious path that seems to provide quick riches and fast cash. Most traders attempting to time the market, thinking that they are smarter and more insightful than other traders, some do get lucky and make a lot of money in a short period of time. This makes them feel validated, feeding into their own self-fulfilling prophecy that they're indeed gods of the market. However, value investing fundamentally discourages is this risky path, and the reasons are simple. One can think of the market index or the total stock market index as a zero-sum game where its value is equivalent to the sum of all investments from both investors and speculators. In the index, if the index rises at the same rate as the output from all investors, then the total output of speculators must be zero. Speculators can't perform long-term due to the previous point. If they do better in the short term, this can be seen as some form of legalized front-running or the murky area of information exploitation or insider information. The margin of safety refers to the built-in cushion for any downside risk in an investment. As established with the Mr. Market analogy, the market is irrational and can stay irrational for long periods of time. Leaving a large gap between what you invest and what you believe the intrinsic value is, is recommended in order to stay afloat during the treacherous waves of the market. The circle of competence refers to the concept of finding the limit of your knowledge and abilities. Value investors tend to believe that the act of investing should be a reflection of one's knowledge and wisdom. The most difficult thing for value investors is figuring out their own limitations and to set boundaries. These boundaries are meant to discipline themselves so that they don't get distracted by greener pastures outside of their circle of competence. The two main questions that we should always ask ourselves are, number one, what areas or fields of study or industry am I truly an expert in? And number two, how do I know if or when I have achieved true mastery? These are very tough questions to answer. When the market moves against you, it you and everyone else is making money while you feel like you're a loser. How do you stand by your decision and feel confident that you made the right bet? Lou thinks that when searching for your circle of competence, you have to find the smartest person who has an imposing view to be your devil's advocate. If you're able to convince the other person, then you are closer to the truth and competency. You have to welcome criticism and build a team of people around you who have opposing views, who can challenge your ideas. Even after all of these efforts, when you've convinced all of the smart people that your idea is superior, it's still possible for there to be blind spots. You'll have to spend a lot of time perfecting your logic and knowledge to be able to better understand and predict the world. Li Lu encourages investors to think like an economist, a sociologist, and a psychologist in order, in other words, think broadly and deeply. Finally, we will end this video by covering some additional gems from Li Lu's investing. In the book, Li Lu had many thoughts on the notion of temperament. He suggests that value investors have five key characteristics. They are loners with independent thoughts and opinions. People who pay less attention to popular trends and opinions are usually better value investors. Lou believes that investors' circle of competence rarely overlap, so it's unnecessary to over-communicate. Since value investors aren't believers in diversification, they wouldn't need to invest in too many ventures. Also, the less time that we spend talking with others about the new hot thing, the more time we have to research a few companies to invest in. They are rational and objective. People who are less affected by emotions are usually better value investors. There are countless books and articles warning beginner investors about their emotions, which 
may lead them to buy and sell at the wrong time. They are patient. Berkshire is the perfect example of this. They're willing to sit on a pile of cash for years or decades if they believe that there's no attractive deals on the market within their circle of confidence. They are decisive. Decisiveness is often seen as a characteristic that contradicts patience. However, however, a good value investor must possess both qualities. He or she must be willing to wait as long as necessary, even years, without making a move, but will pounce on an opportunity with big wagers when it presents itself, which is usually during a bear market. And finally, they are also passionate. Passion for learning is arguably the most important. As an investor, having passion for all aspects of business is certainly important as well. Charlie Munger often credits his success and longevity to his interest in money sense and his passion for business in general. He often says that a good investor must also be a good businessman and should have a grasp on business operation. This interest should prompt questions like, what makes a company successful? Why does it make money? What would the future look like for an industry? What's its competitive landscape? Of intellectual honesty also formed a key part of Lee Lu's theory on value investing. The majority of research issues do not generate immediate results. Investments can be viewed as forecasts of the future, yet the future is rarely predictable. As a result, attempting to forecast the future has such a minimal chance of success that one must be comfortable with not knowing anything. For value investors, having low expectations, a scientist's attitude, and healthy relationships with failure and ambiguity are essential. Lilu also said that a large part of value investors' time should be spent reading. Reading should consist of everything and anything, but especially history, business history, and companies' annual reports. Munger is famous for being a biography nut, and Buffett is known for spending 80% of his waking hours reading. By doing a vast amount of reading, research, and analysis, you can better understand the success of past predictions. This practice trains yourself to be able to sniff good investments helping value investors make more educated predictions in the future. In this book, he also talks about one of the hardest things to do as an investor, which is to sell. Surprisingly, Li Lu outlines that there is a crucial time for value investors to sell. He suggested that you should sell when, number one, you realize that you've made a mistake with your evaluation of the company after your research. In this case, you should sell immediately. Number two, you see a better opportunity that has a better bang for a buck, or when the opportunity cost has become too high. Number three, the valuation becomes too drastic and significantly derailing from the intrinsic value. He also advised others to avoid short selling like several other value investors like Manish Prabhai, Charlie Munger, and Guy Spear. These are three characteristics of short selling that people may overlook. Number one, theoretically a stock can lose 100% of its value, yet the percentage of increase can be infinite. If you short a stock, you have to understand the asymmetric risk that you're taking on. Number two, the best time to short a stock is usually when a company experiences some type of crisis, such as the discovery of accounting fraud, insolvency, or something else. Often, fraud exists for a long time in a company while the stock continues to increase, and since you have to pay interest when short selling, the pressure of a short squeeze may bankrupt an investment before the company goes under. Number three. Short selling exerts a large amount of pressure and occupies the entire mental capacity of an investor. Lilu believes that the confusion and lack of mental clarity short selling creates is its deadliest sin. Investors often discount the opportunity cost of this lack of concentration and sharpness that one should always possess. 
Lilu believes that he lost many great investment opportunities during his time of being a short seller because of these issues. In fact, in the book, he says that he knew about the 2008 financial crash and buy CDS or credit default swaps. But in 2006 and 2007, he had several discussions with Charlie Munger and was convinced that it would be immoral to bet against the housing market and make money off of taxpayers, even if it meant that he would make a lot of money off of it. It's clear that he wants to invest ethically and for the long term. Lilu stated that low interest rate environments are historically rare. However, it is even rarer when all major countries around the world are doing the same QE slash low interest rate central bank interface. If you consider low interest rates as some sort of discount rate, then you may be wrong about your assessment of their margin of safety. Low interest rate environments are, number one, usually temporary, and number two, should be seen as a warning sign because they don't prevent the economy from getting worse. In low interest rate environments, investors should set their margin of safety requirements higher, not lower. Lilu also talks about his thoughts about management in the company and considers it crucial. He believes that during the time of normalcy, management holds relatively less importance in the value of a mature company. In China, most companies are still in their infancy, so it's more important to consider management as a part of the valuation process. And finally, Lu suggested that when people begin talking about cycles, they stop being value investors. Nobody who is honest with themselves can predict cycles. When you get into the business of predicting cycles, you'll find that besides longer cycles of bubbles, there are infinitely smaller cycles down to weeks or even days. If you're interested in learning more about cycles, there's an informative video on this channel that I cover on Howard Marks's book, Mastering the Market Cycle. These are some of Lilu's best tips for value investing from his book, Civilization, Modernization, Value Investment, and China. I hope that they have helped improve your investing game. What other advice have you gotten from Li Lu that I may have missed? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd like to leave you with one of my favorite Li Lu quotes in the book, where he's asked if he could give advice to those who want to engage in investment management. He said, You must learn from the best people, listening, researching, and reading. Before, the best way to understand investment is to practice, and there is no better way. The best practice is to choose a company and to study it thoroughly with the mentality to invest, although you may not really put your money into it. But it is very valuable to thoroughly study a process of a company from the perspective of assuming that you own 100% of the company's equity. Starting from choosing a company in your own ability circle and thoroughly researching it, this is a very good starting point for beginners. If you can start from this foundation, then you'll be on the right path to become an excellent securities analyst. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like this video, please share it with your friends and family. It helps the channel a great deal. Leave in the comments section your thoughts about the video and who I should cover next. With that said, thank you guys so much for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.